Hi, my name is Larissa Kaiser, and I am the founder and co-organizer of Jill, a Women Plus in Translation reading series that spotlights women and or non-binary translators, or translators of women and or non-binary authors, or both. And I am Elizabeth Redfield. I am the co-organizer of Jill. Um, and we welcome your submissions. Jill uh, runs an ongoing virtual reading series, which you're watching right now. You can find out more about what we're looking for and how to submit your work on our website, www.jillreadingnyc.com. And now enjoy the reading. I'm Dorothy Potter Schneider, and I'd like to read you a story by Mexican writer Monica Lavin called Initials, Iniciales. My translation of this story was published in the April 2019 issue of Review, Literature and Arts of the Americas. Iniciales, de Monica Lavin. Sé pocas cosas, es verdad. Vienen dos personas que dicen que son mis hijos y veo su rostro apesadumbrado cuando no emito palabra alguna. Papá, soy Hilda, insiste una señora que pasa los cincuenta y que tiene el pelo color cobre, y saca unas fotos de la cartera y me presenta a mis nietos, Rodrigo y Azucena. Y yo asiento, nada más por barrerle el pesar a esa mujer que se atribuye mi paternidad. No sé si creerle, y en todo caso, si lo hiciera, sería solo eso, buena voluntad y pasajera, porque no tengo nada que contarle de su infancia, de su adolescencia que seguramente nos costó quebraderos de cabeza a su madre y a mí, y todavía más la de su hermano Hilario, que viste traje y solo tiene la hora de la comida para ponerse junto a mi cama y platicarme de cuando lo llevaba a jugar fútbol. ¿Qué ideas tienen algunas personas de nombrar a sus hijos Hilda e Hilario con H los dos? Podría haberme llamado Hugo o Héctor o su madre Elena, muy romanos y con ganas de conservar la H. Pero si de algo puedo estar seguro es que mi nombre no comienza con H. Sé que soy muy meticuloso porque llevo puesta una camisa con un monograma bordado en el bolsillo CLM. Esas iniciales algo dicen de mí. No solo reflejan mi nombre, sino mi manía por tenerme bordado, por identificar mis prendas. Una camisa amarillo claro de buena clase. Cuando me ayudan a desvestir en la noche, les pido me lean la etiqueta y me entero que las hace un sastre, un tal Leopoldo Guerra. I don't know much, it's true. Two people come by who say they're my children and I see their heartbroken faces when I don't utter a single word. Papa, it's Hilda, insists a 50-ish woman with auburn hair, and she takes some photos out of her purse and introduces me to my grandchildren, Rodrigo and Azucena, and I nod my head for no other reason than to dispel the sorrow of that woman who attributes her paternity to me. I don't know whether to believe her or not, and even if I did, it would be only that, belief, passing goodwill, because I've nothing to tell her about her childhood or adolescence, which doubtless caused her mother and me quite a few headaches, and it was probably even worse with her brother Hilario, who wears his suits and has only his lunch hour to stand at my bedside and go on and on about how I used to take him to play soccer. What's the idea of some people naming their kids Hilda and Hilario, both with an H? I could have been named Hugo or Hector, or their mother Helena, very Roman, very eager to hang on to their H. But if I'm sure of one thing, it's that my name does not begin with an H. I know I'm very meticulous because I'm wearing a shirt with a monogram embroidered on the pocket, C-L-M. Those initials make a statement about me, and they reflect not only my name, but also my obsession for having my things monogrammed, for identifying my articles of clothing. A light yellow shirt, elegant. 
When they help me undress at night, I ask them to read me the label, and I'm informed that a tailor makes them, a certain Leopoldo Guerra. I am Carlos Lira Morales, and I have a yellow shirt with my initials on it. I'm crazy about tailoring and monograms. I'm a lawyer. Lawyers do such things. And my wife ran off with my partner, who was a much nicer guy than me. Attorney Ortuño took advantage of some business in Germany that I had to deal with to call her up, send her flowers, invite her out to dinner, put his charms on full display, and then ask her to move in with him for good, so that by the time I got back, the house was in disorder and none of her perfumes were in the closet or the dresser drawers or the bathroom, neither her jewelry nor her clothing, which must be why my children never mention her. They've stopped speaking about her. And it's her fault that I'm here being taken care of by nurses and without a memory. A youngster who calls me grandpa comes with Hilda. When did I become not just a father, but a grandfather? They bring over a mirror so that I can see myself in it and then take a look at the grandson. How alike we all are, Hilda murmurs, moved. Standoffish like me, the kid gives me an obligatory hug and I say, glad to meet you, kid. But the auburn-haired lady says, we see each other every Sunday. How can this be? The so-called grandson looks at his watch. He's uncomfortable. I tell him to go and pay no attention to the strange lady. The boy says, goodbye, Grandpa, to satisfy the lady who's visibly upset, and he leaves. She looks at me earnestly. Papa, the doctors say they've changed your medication and you have a new cognitive exercise routine. I run my hands across the embroidery on my pocket. The shirt is sky blue and has some initials, C-L-M. Are you by any chance Hilda Logroño, I say to the woman there, because I'm Celso Logroño Mendez. Papa, where did you get that from? I cut the story off there to avoid upsetting her, so she'll have to go looking for some other father in the hallways of this place. I keep to myself that I inherited some hotels my father built in Tlalpan, that I've been managing them since I was 20, and that I've seen both good and awful things happen in their rooms, but that I've made money and I've been able to travel to Galicia once a year with my whole family, which clearly does not include her or the youngster who just left. I start feeling nostalgic for Ribeiro wine and chorizo. I ask her to take me to the dining room, even though I'm not hungry yet. She's not allowed in there, and I really want her to go away. This morning, Hilda and Hilario have come together. They introduce themselves and say it's Sunday, and they start telling me how nicely my paella used to turn out in the garden of the Cuernavaca house and how Hilario had gotten drunk for the first time and threw up on the azaleas in front of the guests and how his mother was horrified and sent him to his room. But how I, instead of reprimanding the boy or taking my wife's side, laughed and laughed and brought him a coffee and the one who ended up leaving offended was their mother. How's she doing? I risk asking them to keep the conversation going. I don't want them to feel bad because I like them thinking I'm the guy who used to cook rice to perfection and knew that you had to buy the sausages in the second stall at the San Juan market, just like they're telling me I am. But they go quiet. Hilario squeezes my hand. I don't dare ask any more questions. And when they leave, I breathe a sigh of relief that I can be Cesar Luis Macias, and not have to think about paellas or children or grandchildren, but just manage the company accounts to have my correct job and my apartment in Colonia Cuauhtémoc, to have fallen in love with the assistant accountant who keeps my shirts cleaned and ironed and who smells so good when she sleeps next to me and who gets me all aroused in the morning with her womanly body and plump legs. My erection surprises me, and I conceal it with the blanket covering my knees. These poor people who visit me think I'm suffering over the absence of the woman I once had. They don't know about the real-life ecstasies of Cesar Luis. Today, I asked the Auburn lady to go away. 
She spoke to me in the voice of someone talking to a little kid, asked me if I'd taken my medicines, if I slept well. Papa, I'm going to call the doctor. You seem quite agitated. And I told her I am not her papa, that she should leave me in peace, and I don't know who she is. And very calmly, as if she didn't mind my annoyance one bit, she turned on a machine from which came a melody, and she looked at me, hopefully. Your favorite, papa. I've never heard that song, and I'm tired of having to be here in the company of a complete stranger. Get out of here, lady, I tell her. Get lost. I hurl the tiny machine to the floor. And when she leaves, presumably to go looking for a nurse, I discover the source of my uneasiness as I raise my hand to my pocket and fail to feel the raised pattern of embroidery there. Today, I'm not wearing a monogrammed shirt. Anxiously, I open the closet where she keeps my clothes and I discover that they're not there as usual. I stretch out on the bed. I lie there staring at the ceiling. Probably I fall asleep. Today a man came, he says. His name is Hilario. A fat woman with curly hair comes with him. He says it's his wife, my daughter-in-law. I touch my pocket. I don't answer. He tells me that some other woman named Hilda has gone on vacation and she won't be coming for a few days. I don't care what he says. I don't know who he is. A woman walks in and hangs clothes in my closet. She has auburn hair and a tan. She comes over and gives me a kiss. This kind of treatment bothers me. I don't kiss people I don't know. I wipe her saliva off my cheek and she laughs. Oh, Papa. I give her a severe look. They tell me you've not been eating well. It must be because I haven't come to visit, but I'm back from Cancun now. I won't go away anymore, Papa, I promise. And I'm going to bring the photo albums. That voice tires me out. It makes me incredibly tired. The woman gets up to close the closet door. No, I tell her. I caught sight of the pocket of a yellow shirt. I'm just able to see the three embroidered letters C-L-M. I'm happy. She is too. Lucky me, I exclaim. I'm Cecilia Landu Martinez. What are you saying, Papa? I ask her for the shirt. Puzzled, she brings it over to me. I run my fingers over the symbols. I used to sing beautifully, but falling in love makes you lose your head and your voice. He raised horses. Quarter horses were his specialty. He wanted me to go with him. I was his good luck charm. His stable did well when I accompanied him to the racetrack. He would give me gifts and oh, so many caresses at night. I broke my routines, went missing from rehearsals. The new foals got their names from characters in operas because he asked me to baptize them. Mimi. Iphigenia, Tosca, and as he won, I lost my voice. I can no longer sing, I tell the woman who now has tears in her eyes. Cecilia is no more. She looks at me alarmed and hurries from the room. I attempt some warbles, notes that might recall the soprano I once was, but it's no use. Sad and resigned. I caress my initials and hide the shirt beneath my pillow.